Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is a good God. Amen. Uh, so a couple things I, I, I want to um, just talk about real quick before we get into the word. Uh, one, um, the uh, order forms are ready in, in the void if you've not seen that yet. Uh, so keep in mind a couple of things. Uh, one, the hoodie, as we said, Sunday is going to be what you see, but with additional writing on the sleeves. And then this is the wrong shade of red. No matter what Greg thinks, this is the wrong shade of red. So it's going to be more of a bright red. Um, and so keep that in mind as you're ordering. And, and then you're, you, you'll need to specify, if you do it tonight, you need to specify uh, whether you want the shirt, the hoodie, or both. And so we want to give that option to you. And then all you need to do is put uh, your gender and your size, how many of that that you want, what, what style that you want, and then uh, we'll order them. Payment is due when they come in. So no money is due when you sign up, okay? Does that make sense? And the reason I'm saying that is I don't have an exact amount for you. We have approximate amounts. I'd rather order them and give you the exact amount than just guesstimate and have to deal with all of that. Does that make sense to everybody? And so, uh, so make that available to you tonight if, if that's something you're interested in. A uh, second thing I wanted to mention uh, is that we had our post-op appointment today and um, got a really good report from the doctor, praise the Lord. And so God, God is a good God, amen? And so he said uh, that that second area of concern uh, that looked healed on Friday today is completely healed, not, a, not even a sign that there was ever an issue. Uh, amen. And then uh, the skin and the stitched area in his words looked perfect. And so praise the Lord for that. So nothing and I don't want to gross people out, but nothing seeping or draining or anything. Uh, it, it looked, he said it, if he could design it to look away, that's the way that it looked. And so God is God is faithful. And um, and so he said probably in the next three to four weeks stitches out and then start putting weight. And then he said today, he said, actually, you probably could. He said, but let's just use some precaution here and, and don't. And so that's uh, that's kind of we talked to I talked to Greg today about how people of faith sometimes make bad patients. <laughs> no, seriously, because we'd rather fight with the doctor than do what he tells us to do. And I've learned faith and wisdom are not enemies. Faith and wisdom work together. Amen. Does that make sense now that we've stirred up everybody? Um, but faith and wisdom work together. So I, I always am on the side of be a good patient and make God make the doctor say he was wrong. Amen. Amen. And so that's that's kind of where we're at with all that. So thank you so much. We're still going to take it easy and, and do the things the doctor's telling us to do. And we're going to let God do the miracle himself. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, sometimes God heals supernaturally. Sometimes God heals through medical intervention. And I know not a lot of people believe that, but it's the gospel truth. Um, um, Oral Roberts said that. He said he got criticized for starting Oral Roberts University Medical School. And they said, I thought you were a man of faith. He said, I am. But sometimes God doesn't heal supernaturally. Sometimes he gives a man wisdom through the medical field on what to do to bring healing. And that's the, I, if Oral Roberts thought so, I have, I tend to agree with Oral Roberts, okay? And so uh, that's just kind of where we're at with everything. And then at the end of service tonight, um, Stephanie's uh, class uh, with her little children are, are working on a project that we would like everybody's help with. And so if I could just have one, I just don't want to mention it later, I just want to mention it now. Maybe Kimberly can come mention it later. But it's a piece of paper, and it just says, I am thankful for, with a blank space. They would like every adult to grab one of these pieces of paper and write one thing. You're th this is not a notebook. Write one thing you're thankful for, and then leave it on my pulpit before you go. And so don't take it home with you. You don't need to go home and fast and pray about what you're thankful for. Uh, it, it could be it could be God. It could be my pastor. It could be this church. It could be the Holy Spirit. It could be revival. It could be turkey. turkey. It could be sweet potato biscuits. It could be anything. And, and then they're going to take all these pieces of paper. The children are and they're going to link them and make a chain of them. And we're going to put them in the lobby for everybody to see what we're thankful for. I think it's a really cool idea. And I think it's good for children to see what the adults are thankful for. 
And so we always ask the kids, well, what are you thankful for, but it's not common that the adults say what we're thankful for. So I think it's a good idea. So if, if nobody would just run out of here and leave and you just take two minutes, grab a piece of paper, write one thing you're thankful for and place them on the pulpit, uh, Stephanie will, will take them and uh, the kids will, will work with them. Does that make sense to everybody? Thank you for your cooperation with that. All right. Uh, I'm excited tonight uh, about this, this discussion. Um, it was kind of, uh, um, when I left the house this morning, I, I had a title and a scripture and nothing else. And, um, uh, just God, God stirred up some things, a big shout out and thank you to Greg for driving me to Jeff, to Columbia, to Jeff and, and help me take care of the dog and all that good stuff. Uh, but the Lord, as soon as he l walked out of the house, the Lord just really started to deposit some things into my heart. And so uh, ate a quick lunch and then um, feverishly uh, wrote down my notes. Um, and so I want to talk to you about something that I feel is where we are as a church. So we've been talking about God encounters, right? We've been talking about different ways people have encountered God through Scripture. We've talked about how we've encountered God. Uh, but we're going to take a little bit of a different angle tonight, if that's all right. So turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel 47, we'll start with verse number one. And my title tonight is God Encounters Part Four, talking about it versus just diving in. Talking about it versus just diving in. So let's look at Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse number one. Uh, Ezekiel says, then he brought me back to the door of the temple and water was flowing out from under the threshold of the temple eastward. For the front of the temple faced east. The water, this is important, the water was flowing down from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. Okay? Verse 2, then he brought the, me out by the way of the north gate. And led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces east, and the water was coming out on the south side. When the man who had the line in his hand went eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the water. The water reached the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the water, and the water reached the knees. And again, he measured a thousand. And he brought me through the waters, and the water reached my loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the water had risen, enough water. I want you to un underline, circle, star, highlight those two words. Enough water to swim in a river that could not be passed over. He said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. When I returned, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees. That's a different message. On the one side and on the other. Then he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the valley and enters into the sea. When it flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. Every living creature that swarms wherever the river goes will live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come there and the others become fresh. Thus, everything shall live wherever the river goes. Hallelujah. Talking about it versus just jumping in. So the question for us tonight is not whether or not is God's river here. That is not the question. The real question we have to answer is this. Will we be content to just talk about the river or are we absolutely ready to dive into the river? So it is not a matter of Lord send the river. Because 
the river is already flowing. The river is here. Come on, say it with me. The river is here. Come on. Uh, and I got an old, old song I'm trying not to sing. Uh, one that, that 24 years ago got on my nerves. But I've been singing it in my spirit all day today. That's a sign of older age. I'm not going to say old age. I'm going to say older age. Huh? No. No. Think Avon, North Carolina. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and I hated it because I, I don't like the way it is for a drummer. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So let's talk about the river of God real quick. Sorry, we had to have a personal conversation. Sorry. Uh, so let's talk, about, let's talk about the river of God real quick. The river of God is the place where we encounter him. So, so it, cause sometimes we have church lingo that new folks and never been to church folks be like, what are these? These people are nuts. Are these like, a, there's no river here. You know, you, you got to go down to the Missouri River. Let me tell you, the Missouri River fails in, compa fails in comparison to his river. Uh, so the river of God that's flowing in this, it's the place where we encounter him. Amen. The Bible says that his river flows from his altar. This is the revelation Ezekiel got. And I would propose to you the river has not dried up. The river has not stopped flowing. The river's flowing. Amen. So, so we, that's why we, we got to talk about this because each person has to decide, am I content to talk about it like we are tonight or am I ready to dive in? It flows from the altar. Have, have you ever noticed sometimes how it's like the closer you press in the weaker you feel because it flows from his altar. And that is significant because many times what is what ends up happening throughout a sanctuary is because there's something happening in the altar, but it doesn't stay in the altar. Ezekiel said it flowed from the altar. If churches would not close their altars, the river would flow. Are you with me? If churches would not close their altars, the river would flow. That is what God told me. Get to Missouri, open the altars, and don't apologize for it. Because it's from his altar the river flows. We all understand that, right? So, your experience, and I want you to write this down. My experience of the river is based on how I enter. My experience in the river is is 100% based on how I enter the river. So if all I do is talk about the river, my experience will be dry. Okay? But if I'm a forget logic and dive in, my experience is going to be different. Water, the Bible says, flowed from the temple under the altar and flowed eastward. And then the Bible says that he took Ezekiel and walked him through the waters. Can you imagine that? Walked him through the waters. And they measured, and every time they would measure, it got deeper and deeper and deeper. The Bible says there was water to the ankles, there was water to the knees, there was water to the waist, and then there were waters to swim in. Now, I don't want to mess with your theology. I don't want to mess with your Sunday school lessons. I don't want to mess with what you've heard your whole life, but I have done a little bit of homework. And many years ago, God showed this to me. I, because the Bible says the river could not be passed and it didn't make any sense to me because I've never seen a river that cannot be passed because a river is marked by a few things. A river is marked by limits called banks. And any river can be passed, even the largest of rivers, right? Which is why they're not called oceans. They're called rivers. And so I had a hard time with that. And the Lord spoke to me. I was in my office. And at first I started to rebuke it because it challenged me. But the Lord said to me, 
He said, just because it's written in the English version of the King James Bible doesn't mean that's what I said. And I said, I rebuke that new devil. You get out of my office right now. I rebuke. And God said, it's not him. It's me. And he said, get out my language. So I went to the Hebrew and looked up Ezekiel in Hebrew. And I found the word river in English is not actually the word in Hebrew. But when they translated to English, they chose a word that they thought best described it in English of what they were trying to say in Hebrew. But when he saw the waters at the beginning, it was like a river. But then he said, and then the waters grew until they could not be passed and they were waters to swim in and the hebrew word for river in ezekiel when he says and the river was too large to pass through is actually the word flood what starts as rain turns into a river and what starts as a river turns into a flood nothing to control it nothing to bank it in nothing to say well that's too much when a flood comes everything gets submerged in water and that is what Ezekiel saw he saw not the river of God the flood of God and my prayer is if you're looking for some folks to flood how many raise your hand and say, here we are. Come on. Come on. I want so much of the water of God. We got no choice but to swim. Amen. How about you? So, there, so he talks about waters to swim in. Well, let, let's look at Psalm, Psalm 46 and verse 4. And this is why this is important. This verse of scripture is why we're talking about this. Psalm 46 and verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. There is a river God wants to send to this house that will make this place glad. The river of God and depression don't flow together. Gladness, joy, peace, that's what flows together. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. So let's talk about the power of this river. Number one, the water is fresh water. Uh, Ezekiel said, and the water became fresh. And anything swimming in the water, every, every animal that swarms and every fish, and every other living being, the Bible says, became fresh. You cannot have the fresh river of God with an old stagnant theology. With an old stagnant way of doing things. Which is why Sunday we talked about the spirits of tradition, the spirits of religion, and the spirits of bondage. Because there is a freshness to the river of God. And I'm going to tell you when you know you've gotten in the river. When you feel something you've never felt. Why? Because it's fresh. I don't want an old move. I want a fresh move. He said, behold, I will do a new thing. New is fresh. Amen? Look, the only thing stale bread is good for is breadcrumbs. Stuffing, <laughs> breadcrumb stuffing, it's all the same in my book. Fresh bread and stale bread is not the same. Fresh bread is something you want to consume. Stale bread, what am I going to do with this now? Right? French toast maybe, okay? French toast because I'm going to soak it anyway. But, but regard now stop thinking about food for a minute. <laughs> but, but how many knows there's a difference between something new and something old? 
something fresh and something stale. I don't want God to do what he's always done. I want a fresh move. How about you? Everything, the Bible says, in the river comes to life. Everything comes to life. There's healing in the river. There's refreshing in the river. There's revival in the river. There's restoration in the river. How about this one? There's newfound freedom in the river. I've, I've heard some people tes testify to be like, Pastor, I never, I never realized I could experience freedom like this until I got in the altar and God touched me. Well, what happened? They got in the river and they encountered God and there was a newfound freedom. You know what it was? There was a freshness to it. I've heard people say this my whole I've heard people say this my whole life. I didn't know I could feel God like this. I didn't know I could experience God like this. What is that? Freshness. Freshness. And isn't it isn't the funny thing about the the the, the spirit of the Lord is that it can refresh you and exhaust you at the same time. You know what I mean? Maybe you don't. But but the heavier the anointing, the better it feels and the longer it takes my body to recover. Because there's a weightiness. There's a heaviness to the glory of God. There's a weightiness to to the to the presence of God. My mother says this all the time. Nothing feels so good and feels so bad as the anointing. Feels good to our spirit. Man, it'll wear your flesh out. Wear your flesh out. So there's a newfound freedom in the river of God. So this, what I want to talk about, this is where a lot of church folks stop. And it's at the point of talking about it. Talking about the river, talking about, and you know what it is? It's, it's, it's the, um, it's the place of promise. You know what, it, you know what I call, I call it, I call them one day prophets. One day God's going to do it. One day revival's coming. One day the glory will come in here. And I always hated one day promises. Because I don't want God to do something one day. I want God to do something today. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, I, I thank God for promises. I thank God for the prophetic. I thank God for pointing to what he is planning. But at some point, the promise has to become a reality. At some point, we have to stop talking about it and we have to experience it. You know? Like, wouldn't you grow weary if all I ever did is tell you God can heal, but you never see God heal? That is stopping at talking about it. That's stopping at talking about it. Talking about it is where a lot of churches stop. It's where a lot of even people can stop even in a house where the river's flowing. Do you know what it is? It's the place of contemplation. Man. I've seen all those people go to the altar. And you know, Pastor, I wanted to. That is somebody who's comfortable with the talking and uncomfortable with the diving. Are you with me? My goal, and look, y'all are here on a Wednesday night. We, we are not a group of talking about it, folks. My Wednesday night, y'all are crazy enough to come on a Wednesday night when you literally could be doing anything else in the world, and yet you're here because you're hungry and you want to encounter God. So we're not the contemplative, oh, man, those folks really got blessed. Good for them. If I'm not in the altar and I see folks getting fresh touches from God, it would be over my dead body. I stay out of the altar. Um, I, I was coined 
in Bible college, an anointing junkie. I was. Let me tell you something. This is what I figured. I said, I'm going to go to Bible college. I'm going to hang out with Pastor Parsley for two to three years. I'm not going there just to learn the Bible. I'm going there to receive an impartation. And so I, in two years, I responded to every single altar call except for salvation and one for suicide. Every other altar call, whether it fit me or not, I was there. I was there. And I remember one time, Pastor Parsley got up and he said these words. Don't you come down if this ain't you. And I got about halfway and I was like, well, shoot. I'm like, Lord, is it me? I need to, Lord, tell me this is me because I want another touch. And I had a friend, he's like, he's like, you go to every altar call. Where do you think Judah gets it from? And I, I said, I do. He said, why? I said, I didn't come here to get a degree. I came here to experience the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And I don't want to miss out. I knew I didn't need to go get saved. I was saved. I knew I wasn't on the verge of killing myself, so I didn't go. There was one other altar call. There was one for homosexuality and lesbianism. I'm like, nope, not me. Praise God. And praise God for a church that will call it out and offer freedom. So I, I've never been in contemplative, oh, I don't know if I can go to the altar. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost at the age of 11, and man, I've been chasing the anointing ever since. So, so what is talking about it? Talking about the river of God, number one, is the place where spectators reside. Talking about it is the place where spectators reside. Because honestly, we're just more comfortable talking about it than experiencing it. Number two, it's the place where you can see it, but you're not in it. It's the place where you can see it, but you're not in it. Number three, it's the place of decision. Talking about it is not necessarily a bad thing because you can decide to stop your talking and start diving. But many stop talking and pull back. I don't want us to be a church of pullback. I want us to be a church of diving in head first. I'll explain that here in a little bit. Number four, it's the place where you can watch or you can decide to enter in. I said this to somebody in my family. I won't tell you who, although they probably won't see this video. But I said to them, something's wrong. In your life, if you leave a Holy Ghost service and can report to me everything that happened to everybody. Are you with? Why is that a problem? Because you're spectating because you're watching. And I heard this person so, for so many years. Can't really know who I'm talking about. And they would say, oh, you should have saw this person. They fell out sideways. You should have saw that person. They sunk to the floor. And you should have saw that person. They ran and jumped and danced all over the place. And then somebody said to them, well, what happened to you? Oh, I was just blessed watching. What is that? Spectating. That's talking about it. Because how many knows talking about it doesn't require sacrifice? You don't have to lose your pride talking about it. You don't have to risk your dignity talking about it. What happens when you jump in the river? You're going to come out the river looking a little different than when you went into the river. Amen. Your clothes are going to get wet. Your hair is going to get messed up and you're going to feel good. Come on, somebody. It's the place where you can watch or you can decide. Number five. We have a choice to make. 
Come on, say it with me. The river's not coming. The river is here. We, there's, okay, so I don't want you, I, I'm not condemning people who are the talking people. I want to encourage talkers to become divers. I want to encourage spectators to become participators. And, and I've been in that season. You know, when you, when you experience God for the first time and you're like, well, hold on, let me, let me make sure this is God and not man. But then you've got a choice to make. Am I just, am I content to talk? Or do I have to experience it? Do I have to experience it? God will not force anyone into his river. He'll let you be a talker. You know why? He made you that way. He made you a free moral agent. You have a free will to choose. And you can choose to just talk. You can choose to observe. Or you can choose to jump in. I want to jump in. I've always been that way. As a child, I, I was never start in the shallow end and test the waters kind of a guy. I told the story before about how each of my sisters and my father enter the water. You know, my father goes down the steps and he casually swims. My sister will lay out and bake until she's fried. And then she goes and jumps in off the diving board like a stick. And as soon as she gets wet, she pops out and goes and fries some more. <laughs> my oldest sister, I don't recall because she's so much older than I am. I, I just I was too young to realize how she got in the water, if she got in the water. My mother was too busy making sure everybody was lotioned up and safe and having a good time that she could not have a good time herself. Because she's worried about everybody else. So my mother rarely got in the water. My youngest sister, she got in the water. But usually at her pace. And then there was me. I just figured if we're going swimming, what am I going to waste my time in the shallow end for? I can remember, this is God's honest truth. The next time my parents are here, you can ask to see if it's true. It's, I'm telling you it's true. I'm your pastor, I don't lie. I always figured, I remember being five years old, and my dad said, you want to go swimming? And I said, yeah, and I put on my trunks. My mother lotioned me up, which I never understood. I'm going to be under the water. <laughs> and so my mom would lotion me up, and then she's like, go get in the pool. And I had watched my father go into the steps. I had watched my other sister just kind of lay there and bake. My other sister kind of, she would go down the steps in the deep end, but still at her pace. And at five years old, I would run directly to the diving board and jump in head first at five years old into the deep end and in one breath swim all the way to the shallow end of the pool. At five years old, they used to call me fish boy. Don't you call me <laughs> fish boy. <laughs> and at five and to this day, if I decide I'm swimming, why am I going to why am I going to take my time? So I bring that philosophy to the presence of God. If I've decided I'm going into the presence of God, I'm not testing the waters. I don't want a little dab or do you. You know what I'm doing? I'm going to the diving board and I'm going in head first. I'm doing cannonballs. I'm doing jackknives. That's not as violent as it sounds. My favorite thing off the diving board was the preacher seat. If you don't know what the preacher seat is, raise your hand. Oh, let, oh, my, let me teach you. It's when you jump off the diving board like this and fold your hands and the whole, your butt and the whole backside of your legs is what hits the water. It's called the preacher seat. And I, I did the preacher seat until I couldn't walk. Y'all hear me? Okay. So when the presence of God is flowing, when the river of God is here, I don't want you to think you have to dive in. Just get in. 
If you want to be like my dad, come in the shallow end. Come in the steps at your pace. I, if you want to be kind of watching for a long time, then come get a little dip and run back to your seat. That's okay. That's all right. That's all right. If you don't want to jump in the deep end just for a little bit and then jump back out, that's okay. I'm just saying there is a Holy Ghost diving board here if you want it. And you can dive in if you want it. And I'm going to tell you, then this doesn't sound very good. I'm going to say it anyway. You can get as drunk on the Holy Ghost as you want to. It is not up to God how much of him you get. It is up to you how much of him you experience. Go to, you're in Psalms. Go to Psalm 65. Psalm 65. Look at verse 9. Psalm 65, verse 9. You visit the earth and water it. Here's, here's the sentence I want you to pay attention to. You enrich it with the river of God. You enrich the earth with the river of God, which is full of water. You prepare their grain, for thus you have established it. So let's talk about what it means to dive into the river. The question, if before you dive, the question that must be answered is this. How am I going to enter into the river of God? Let me say it in a different way. The question you have to address is how am I going to jump into the presence of God? How am I going to encounter the presence of God? And I want to give you four to five scenarios that I've seen in my ministry and in my life how people enter the presence of God, okay? Let's go over them, write them down. I don't want you to forget them. So the first thing the Lord told me this, if all you want is a little, then there are waters for your ankles. And it is, and I do not want you to feel shame. Hear me clearly. I do not want you to feel shame if you are in that place I just want a touch from the presence of God. That's not a bad place to be because water to the ankles is better than no water at all. Can I get a witness from anybody in this place right now? Water, water is good even if all it is is on your ankles. You know what? I can't get this foot wet right now. I'll take some ankle water right now. How about you? Amen. But there are people and hear me very clearly, who love God, who are good Christian folks, who never miss a Sunday, who are faithful tithers, who volunteer, who serve, and who will do anything for you. But when it comes to the presence of God, a little of it is good enough. And we are not to shame those people. What are we to do? Encourage them. Why? Because if a little feels good to you, Let's go a little deeper. Amen. Who wants to go a little deeper? You better raise your hand. Amen. No, no shame. Number two. Number two. Now, some of this is going to be hard to hear if, if it's you. So don't be offended. Glean from this. But I'm going to give it to you the way the Lord gave it to me. Is that okay? The second thing he said is, if you want to remain in full control, there's water up to your knees. There's plenty of water at knee level. I don't want you to think because you have control issues that you can't get into the presence of God. You can. You can. And, and when the Lord said that to me, the picture I got is of my wife. And I'm, and I'm not... I'm not insulting her or putting her down, but after 20 plus years of seeing her at the beach, this is what I've seen. My wife is comfortable in the ocean at knee level, up to waist level, maybe, sometimes depends. Really, mid thigh is her limit. I think part of it is if she sees a shark, she can run out of there before she can get hurt. In the water, in full control. Okay? 
I like to go out in the ocean where my feet don't touch the ground. Y'all got me? And so I will always beckon my wife, come on. She goes, no, I'm in control here. But how many know there are church folks like that? They want more of God, but they don't want to lose control. Can I, can I tell you, I've seen this my whole life. It's people who want to be in the altar, but they don't want to fall down. People who, who want to feel what God is doing, but they don't necessarily want to be one of the ones he's doing it to. I've seen it my whole life. It's not a bad place to be. Why? Number one, you're not spectating. Number two, you're not testing the waters. You're in the water. You are in the water. You know what? If you go to a swimming pool and you walk down the steps until the water hits your knees, you are not laying out frying like my sister. What are you? In the pool. You are in the water. If that is you, if you're like, Pastor, I want it, but I'm scared to lose control. Just get in the water. Because you know what happens when you get knee deep? You start to get curious what the deeper waters will feel like. I can remember my father always used to say this to my sisters. You got to swim deeper. And they're like, why? And he was like, because the wind is blowing and it's going to make you think the water's colder than what it is. Because more of you is exposed than is under the water. So he would say, swim deeper, swim deeper. And I can remember my sister saying, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good, Daddy. I'm fine. I'm fine. What does that mean? I want to be in control of where I'm at. I don't want, to, I don't want my daddy to force me to do anything. How many church folks have the same mentality? I'm fine, God. I'm fine. I'm fine. That was good. That was good. I got my little sh- Yes, hallelujah. Now I go back to my seat. I got water up to my knees. Do not be the type of Christian that compares your knees to somebody else's ankles. And allow pride to fill your heart. And do not compare yourself to somebody who's waist deep and feel like you're not good enough. If all you are at in your walk with God is knee level, Stay there. But I'm telling you. He's beckoning you. To come deeper. Let's go deeper. Number three. The Lord said to me today, if you want to press in. But are uncertain what the deep waters will be like. There's water to your waist. There's water to your waist. When we were dating, Kimberly was much more adventurous in the ocean than she became as my wife. I don't know if that's on me or not. But I can remember when we were dating, maybe she just wanted to be close to me. Or maybe I did something to ruin her trust. I don't know. That's possible. But this one day, we were at the beach in Florida. Or no, South Carolina. We were in Myrtle Beach together. And I said, will you, will you do me a favor? She's like, sure, honey. <laughs> I miss those days. <laughs> she, said, she said to me, well, well, sure, honey. And I said, would you just come waist deep with me? And then she looked at me and she said, who's waist? <laughs> I said, what? what? She's like, you're like a foot taller than me. And I said, come to my waist. I said, I won't let you drown because I'm a good boyfriend. I was a better boyfriend than a husband, I promise. <laughs> and so she's out there, and we're jumping waves together. We're having a good time, and she's laughing. I said, see, knee water is fine, but waist is so much better. And she's like, it's all right. And then we got married. And I, I was a smart enough boyfriend to know, don't press your luck, Tim Mar. 
let's stay right here. So, and I wanted to be with her. So then we, we're married sometime. We're youth pastoring on the Outer Banks. And we lived across the street from the ocean. So we go over to the ocean this one day. And she stopped at knee level. And I said, come on, babe, let's go waist level. She was like, all right. You know, newlyweds still want to be together. So she comes out waist level with me. And like a bad husband, I'm going to tell her myself now, like a bad husband, I put my arm around her waist. And I said, if you think this is good, wait until you feel chest deep. And I gave her a nudge. I know, moan and groan. I get it. <laughs> I said I was a bad husband. I'm owning that. And immediately, she ran back to knee level. She goes, I'm fine. You go swim. So I went out neck deep. And I'm out there with the waves. And then I felt guilty. So then I said, I I I'll go to knee level. And I was thinking about that today. M that memory came to me. And I remember the feeling in the look in my wife's eye of there's a certain discomfort here. But I have no idea what that deep water is like. So I must stay. And that mentality in the church doesn't just make you stay. Sometimes it makes you retreat. And sometimes how somebody experiences God will excite you. And sometimes how somebody experiences God will make you fearful. Because you'll look at them and you'll be like, oh, my God, that looked like that hurt. <laughs> have you have you never thought that? Let me tell you a quick story. I know I'm rambling. Let me tell you a quick story. I was 12 years old in the church. My dad pastored had theater seats. When you would stand up, the seat would pop up and on and the back side of that theater seat was all metal. This woman in the church, she was like like six one. And she was not far enough towards the steps. And my father just walked towards her and he took his coat and he went. Whew, like that and nothing touched her and she fell like a tree and she landed head first against that metal plate underneath that let me tell you something let me let me help you understand what this 12 year old boy heard Bang! her head slammed against that metal plate and I thought if my dad calls me to the altar he can forget it She got up, and I was scared out of my mind. My sister looked at me like, did you see that? Because back then, we were faith people, which meant we didn't have catchers. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I know you know what I'm talking about. If it's God, they won't get hurt. And if it's not God, it's a lesson learned. <laughs> have you ever heard that or said that? Raise your hand. Wisdom's not the enemy of faith. So she came to, because I thought she was unconscious. And she got up and she said, hallelujah. I went over and I said, you all right? She's like, and I felt like they do on TV. Do you know your name? <laughs> do you know where you are? What is today? Who's the president? She was like, why are you asking me these questions? And I, I said, are, are you all right? She's like, yeah. I said, what did that feel like? She said, I don't know if I fell into feathers or a soft mattress. She said, but it was beautiful. And I went, <laughs> I went and sat down. And my dad was like, whoever's hungry, come to the altar. And I'm like, nope, I'm going to sit right here. Uh, I was I was near the altar, but there's no way I was testing that. So I say all that to say. Being waist deep is a great place to be. 
I've seen people baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues that were waist deep. But don't let the unknown of the deep waters make you afraid. Just take a swim. Number four, this is what the Lord said to me. If you're ready to dive in head first, there is water that is plenteous to swim in. There's more than enough water. Can I tell you, let, let me just say this before we close. There's more than enough water no matter which level you're at. But under God, let's not just talk about it. Let's dive in. Let's go in. And it, 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 whether you are in that place of ankle, knee, waist, or diving in, there's more than enough water for you. The river of God has not run dry. And it never will. God has it here. And, and I want to tell you something. I want to go back to, we just talked Sunday about the miracle Jerry received on that Friday night. He was standing right here, and, and I noticed he was like swaying. And I said to him, you look like you're in an ocean. And he said, I feel the ocean floor, and it's moving my legs. He said, there are waves in this place. When I tell you the river's here, the river's here. Have some of you, I want to raise your hand if, if this has been your experience. Have some of you been in the altar and then it was like the further in you walked, you felt overwhelmed by something? It's like you can be standing here one minute, then all of a sudden something sweeps over you. That's the river. That's the presence of God. That's the water of the Holy Spirit. I was in the ocean as a child. And my dad said to me, let's go jump the waves. I said, let's go. And he was much more adventurous in an ocean than he ever was adventurous in our swimming pool. That makes no sense to me. There's no logic to that. It's like I'm in a pool. I'm safe. I'm going to take it easy. I'm in an ocean where literally anything in this water can kill me. Let's go deep. <laughs> Seriously, right? That's what my wife says. Exactly. Leave me by my knees. But, you know, my father said, let's go. And so we're out there chest deep. I was a teenager. I was about his height at the time. We both were chest deep. And he goes, what's your mother doing? I said, I have no idea. So he turns around back to the waves. I am standing there watching the waves. <laughs> and about this time, high tide started to roll in. And he was trying to find out what my mother was doing. And she was reading a book. And he's trying to get her attention. Mary, Mary, come out where the water's fine. You know, and about the time he's doing that, the waves start getting a little higher, but they're still chest to shoulder deep, nothing major. And then I saw something about three levels deep. Anybody been in the ocean, you know what I'm talking about. You know, like when you're in where the waves are crashing, but you see more waves are coming. And I saw it. And like a good son, I said nothing. <laughs> and I said, oh, he's going to get destroyed. I was about 15, 16 maybe. And I seen this wave. And then he felt, he's like, oh, they're starting to come in. Oh, man, I wish your mother. And he no longer got those words out. Man, I wish your mother. And this wave, about four feet over surface level, swelled up. And all I said was, better jump. <laughs> and I, I mean, I got all the muscles in my legs bent down, and I jumped, and it got, like, above my nose. My father did not jump. <laughs> and it crashed over him. And it sent him 
about 15 feet towards the shore. And I just started laughing and laughing and laughing. He comes back to where I am. He called me a name I'm not going to say. <laughs> it wasn't vulgar. I just don't care for you to know the name that he said. And he said to me, why didn't you warn me deeper water was coming? And my, I'm so sorry, I'm ashamed to say this. My reply, and I don't feel this way as a pastor, so rest at ease. My, my reply to him was simply this. Sometimes... It's more fun when someone is unassuming <laughs> to watch what the water can do. And can I tell you, as an evangelist, I 100% agree with that statement. But as a pastor, and the more the Lord has put a shepherd's heart inside of me, I don't want anybody to have an encounter that makes them scared of deeper waters. I want you to realize there's joy in the deeper waters. There's healing like you can't imagine. There's restoration like you can't imagine. There's goodness like you can't imagine. So if you're ready, get into the deeper waters. Come on, let's go deep together. And I can tell you my wife is way more willing to get into the deep waters of God <laughs> than she is the deep waters of the Atlantic. <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean. And so my encouragement, this is, and, and I hope you got something out of this teaching tonight, but my encouragement for everybody in this, if, if you're in that place where you're contemplating, it's okay to be there, but let's not stay there. Let's get in. Let's get in. Many will come. Because they're curious. But if they get in the water, the water will keep them. I don't want a church that operates on man's programs. I want a church that's full of the river of God. Tommy Tenney, with this I close, Tommy Tenney said these words. If it's real, we have nothing to fear. If it's real, we have nothing to fear. And can I tell you what goes on up here is 100% real. Some of you have felt it. Some of you have experienced that. Matter of fact, looking around, I would say 95% of you have experienced it. You know what my prayer is? My prayer is some guy will be on the altar catching. And when they catch somebody, it'll go right through them into the catcher and down they go with them. And for you catchers, no offense. But I want to see you slam drunk in the Holy Ghost. Absolutely. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. My prayer is people, when they enter the back double doors of this sanctuary, that they will not feel like it's dry back there and wet up here. But there will be ankle ankle waters when they enter the sanctuary. And then knee waters. And then waist waters. And then, whew. A flood of the Holy Ghost in this place. If you want that, raise your hands. Just begin to tell the Lord right now that you want it. Begin to open your mouth. Close your eyes if you need to. And tell the Lord right now, I want more of your river. I want more of your presence. God, we desire more of you. What we've had is not enough. We must have more of you. We must have more. Lord, no matter where we're at in our walk of faith, take us deeper. 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 In Jesus' name. Jesus said in John chapter 7, He that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Can I tell you, the river of God does not just flow in this altar. The river of God flows in your belly. Place a hand on your belly right now and ask the Lord to let it flow. 
Let it flow out of you. Let it flow through you right now in the name of Jesus. Let it flow from